Calvary Recap. It's a special edition here. I'm here with Dr. Gary Bashirs. We're so glad to be with you. Uh, Gary taught this weekend uh, Philippians chapter 4 um, on unity. And so um, the, f- the first question is, why, why do you think Paul thinks it's a, an important topic for a church, unity? <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to live in chaos in a church and see how it works out. No, the unity around the mission that we're called to, that mission of taking the gospel to the world, there's got to be unity around that. And when there's distrust and disunity, we don't work together well. Mm. I mean, that's true all through Scripture, because Satan is trying to destroy our unity to make us fight with each other instead of fighting with him. And so when you talked about unity, you, you talked about, um, in the text, it was very clear, we, we don't know the specific issue, but there seemed to be two individuals that just yep. couldn't work it out. Yodi and Sintiki. And these two women, who are good women, are at odds with each other. And it's not just because they're women. There are men. Who are <laughs> in this case, it's two women, two incredibly godly women leaders who are at war with each other. And he pleads with them, be of one mind. And that's, uh, that his peacemaking is really important. So the, 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 how, does, how does joy fit in with working together in unity? Is it Because you mentioned that quite a bit in the yeah, message. Yeah, he goes on. He, the first three verses there are the unity. I plead with you, be of like mind. And then it's a series of commands. And the first one, verse four, is rejoice. Let your mm. gentleness, and it's a series of commands. Same thing you see in First Thessalonians chapter five. He's like he's coming to the scroll. He's got to get a bunch of stuff down. Uh, so the rejoice yeah. is kind of a theme of the whole book, which is why I spent so much time on joy, including showing pictures of my cute granddaughter. Yeah, no, that, that was that was really good. The 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 and then you say that that all and that framework, the unity, is really based on this idea that we are citizens of heaven. Absolutely. So yeah. so how does the, how does the citizens play into their necessity to have unity? Yeah. If we're having a civil war within a kingdom, it's going to fall down. <clears throat> and what he's saying is because our citizenship in heaven, our unity is the family relationship with father, with son, and our part in that heavenly family, that's where the unity comes from. And a family needs to be united. We're not into controversy and divorce. Mm-hmm. Differ- disagreement, yeah, that's fine. But the unity that comes with our family membership is what he's really focusing on there. And then how do we work that out? <clears throat> in Ephesians, he's just saying make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit. And that's what I was kind of focused on, some steps to how do you maintain the unity when there's a genuine disagreement about details. So, so some people, I think, get confused, especially in a church context. When they think of unity, they think of uh, doctrinal conformity. So what they do is... Every issue in the Bible is a is all is all on the same line. Right. So how so this issue here is more than likely not a doctrinal. It could be maybe the controversy you incident. Yeah. Yeah. We don't know what the controversy was. But where would you draw the line? How do you draw mm-hmm. how do you draw your lines in that respect yeah. to let's just say in a theological yeah. landscape? I end up with four different levels. I talk about a die for, divide for, d- debate for, decide for. Die for is the stuff that's clearly taught in Scripture. If you knowingly deny it, you put your salvation in peril. Mm. If you deny the Trinity, if you deny the deity of Jesus, for example, you're, and do it knowingly, you're putting your salvation in peril. The divide fours are things that are so central to our identity that we can't be a part of the same fellowship. And mm-hmm. we find things like, uh, well, Luther and Calvin did split over the, what the sacrament means, what the Eucharist means. It was so different. We find it today in Pentecostal circles in the Thai style of worship, and you put it against what I call the traditional Baptists, which is, and they're just so different in style. You got to do one or the other. It's a divide for, but we're, we're brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. The debate for is the stuff in the church where we differ. We sit at the same table. We love each other. We laugh together. But when we get in these topics, we start getting sweaty and angry. Well, we're, but there's a unity even as we disagree mm-hmm. on some of those things. So. You know, should you have, I don't know, whatever your, should you have drums on stage? You know, that's a past tense problem mm-hmm. now, but man, it wasn't a few years ago. It was a huge battle. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a debate for in my judgment. So where would you, like, so just like, just I'll throw out some bullet point topics. Where mm-hmm. would you put eschatology in that, those four? Eschatology is too big a thing. Uh, Gary's position, lots of people disagree with me and good and godly people. Uh, to my judgment, and I know this is a hot issue, pre-trib rapture is down at the decide-for level. It's the lowest level. 
I don't think there's enough biblical data to decide whether the tribulation is before or after the rapture. Uh, and I'd be glad to talk to you about that. Other people play that clear up at at least a divide mm. four level uh, because for them it's very important. There's often personal story behind those kind yeah. of things. So when you have people that are in those camps and they're they're trying to they're trying to make those decisions, whether um, I know we had a long talk today about Genesis one and some other topics, mm-hmm. but but how do you how do you seek unity though? That was part of your message. How do you how do you bring somebody in? Yeah, theological unity over things like pre trib rapture. Let's go back to what does the Bible actually say? And it's funny how a lot of debates go from what the Bible says and they go beyond what the Bible says. Because what I say in like pre-trib rapture is where is the position has rapture and tribulation in an ordered relationship? It's just not there. Mm. And that's why I say that I think they're both real, but the order of them, Scripture never puts them in an order where it says rapture, then tribulation. It's a construction. And why don't do people say, okay, I think it fits this way best, but good and godly people take a different view on that. That's where agree. That's where unity happens with disagreement over theological issues. But but the so but the church being citizens of heaven is that if I make that something where where it separates me from other people, I think that's a mistake. Or 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 would it be language? Um, well, I've heard some people do this. Hey, um, you know these people. These are these people. We're these people. Yeah. Like that that that's very unhealthy because that yeah. kind of goes kicks against what Paul's saying. Yeah. We are citizens of heaven first. And if mm. we end up in different tribes or camps or something, let's bless each other, not curse each other, is my thing. And my phrase is, good and godly people disagree with me. Mm-hmm. I don't agree with myself some of the time. <laughs> you know, we don't have to have total agreement on everything. I mean, yeah. you and I don't, so mm-hmm. why should anybody else? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We should convert and agree with what I say, right? <laughs> no, and I think, though, I think what some people do is... Um, Okay, so this is, I think, for me, working with students for a long time, when it comes to the, the position, like you had said, the Trinity and Jesus, um, it, understanding, hey, this is really the central issue. That's correct. And if we keep, if we if we circle around, we rejoice over those things, and then as long as we don't take secondary issues and place them on the same level of Jesus, right. what it does is it produces, I think that's the birthplace of good unity right. with other yeah. believers. When you talk about students, though, what I find is for many students, they don't want to put anything up on that top level. Mm. So, like, is God three persons or in essence? Well, I don't know. You know, it's a, I don't want to be committed to anything. And they don't want anything on the divide, for, on the die for list. Oh, that's and interesting. Things like, okay. the, things like the deity of Jesus to knowingly say, no, Jesus is just a guy. He was a good teacher. At that point, you're committing what we technically call heresy. You're denying the truth of what the Bible clearly says. Mm-hmm. And that Jesus is actually Emmanuel, God with us. That's a vital teaching of Scripture. And annoyingly deny it is to... And for people to say, well, I don't want to be too strong about anything. If the Bible's strong about it, we have to be strong about it. Mm-hmm. A contemporary issue is what is the nature of marriage. Scripture is very clear. Our Savior says in Matthew 19, it's one man, one woman, husband and wife for life. Mm. Anything outside of that is sin. Well, that's really controversial because you get into all kinds of things with that. But the Bible is really clear. That's what a marriage should be. Lots of marriages aren't there because mm. of sin, to be sure. But say God is fine with, uh, well, I don't like her. I'm going to divorce her. That's not okay. That's sin. Mm-hmm. Uh, to, and there are other kinds of things. One man, one man married together. That's legal in our country, but it's not biblically blessed. Mm-hmm. And, and so those things, when, t- yeah, those are going to be very divisive things because we have to make a decision. Of what is the Bible clearly teaching? And so those things, those things work out. And and so the last point is, uh, what would be the the you would list a series of ways of how to seek unity with someone? I guess the I know for me, I think the biggest fear is to recognize you know there's a problem. So how do you how do you you, you we always expect the other person to come to us. We don't we don't want to do it ourselves. But what would be helpful for somebody to? Hey, I know I'm at odds with somebody. Uh, what what would what would be the, the biblical command? Is it the first art? You know, do I need to understand what I'm going to say, or what what does that look like? Uh, M- Matthew, Jesus says, if you are coming to the altar, I was talking about Jewish altar there. If you come to the altar with your sacrifice and you know your brother has something against you, put your sacrifice down 
go make right thing with your brother. Because what he's saying is no sacrifice is going to make up for the fact that I hate my brother. Okay. So he's mm-hmm. saying don't do your sacrifice becomes meaningless if you hate your brother. Or if your brother hates you. Mm-hmm. So I think the thing is if there's a rift in a relationship, I, whoever I is on either side, it's my job to go to my brother or sister and softly, gently, gracefully, lovingly say, there's an issue between us. Let's talk. Let's achieve understanding. Like, what is going on here? Mm-hmm. Really try to do it. And I think that burden is on everybody. Now, I'm in a situation, it's been, it's over a decade old now with a guy that I hurt badly. I didn't know I was doing it. <clears throat> a guy I was really close to, and I was doing some stuff, and it was hurting him. And he's a, he's out of a really difficult home life, and he didn't have the ego strength to tell me that I was hurting him. And I hurt him badly. And it was totally unintentional. And when I look back and I just regret it so deeply, I have gone to him. He won't talk to me directly, but I've gone through any memories and said, anytime, anywhere, any terms, I want to talk. Mm. I don't know if that'll happen or not. But the, mm. see, that's my burden, is I know I hurt him. I was wrong. I didn't know it. But uh, I, anytime, any terms, I want to talk. Mm. We're not going to agree. We're not going to be close friends again. I mean, I wish we could, but I just, I, I, you know, I want to talk. And that's the thing. If I know that there's a rift between me and my brother or sister, let's go talk about it. I don't have to have my ducks in a row. In fact, it might be a really good idea, as I said, to take somebody with me who would help me do that. Yeah. Help us because emotions get out of control. Mm -hmm. That's a role I do as a, as a mediator is I sit with people who are fighting with each other and keep their emotions a little bit calm. Mm-hmm. Help them listen to each other. Help them repeat back things to mm-hmm. each other. But I think the burden is if I've got a rift between me and my brother or sister, I should go gently, calmly, and with help mm-hmm. and seek unity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's so important. And I think that was the, the nice, the beautiful part of it is, as a citizen of heaven, that you've been granted into a place with him because yep. of what he's done, yep. which now frees me to be able to rejoice, because yep. I couldn't before. Right. And then now I have a thing called joy... But that, those are the things that help me to push into, I guess, more difficult things and yeah. work through them. Yeah. The Lord is near. That's Be right. gentle mm-hmm. in what you do. And that's the heart of it all is the Lord is near. It doesn't say his coming is near. That's a different issue. It said the Lord is with us. Yeah. And you made a great analogy of it. the priest would go up. He would yep. go into the temple. But this is the Lord drawing coming near, drawing, to, drawing to near to us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that so in that when we do this, we know that he's with us and not. Right. Yeah. And that gives us the power of the Holy Spirit to do the work that needs to be done to achieve a genuine unity instead of just covering it over with vanilla to make it look like we're together, but in mm-hmm. fact we can't even talk to each other. Mm-hmm. Which is the difference between unity and uniformity. Yep. Now that's a yep. huge... Thing. Or we have to say anybody with a beard is clearly an ungodly guy, right? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> no. That was the thing. I mean, I back in the 60s, I listened to a guy in concert. He was incredible. I got done. I was talking to him in my church. He said I couldn't hear him. What do you mean you couldn't hear him? He had an incredible voice. I couldn't hear him because of his beard. And I started laughing. I realized she was dead serious. That anybody with a beard was a bad person. Hmm. And it just left me speechless, which is really unusual. <laughs> no, that but is that, funny. Yeah. That's the kind of thing where there's just, you know, they're just a ridiculous level. Because at yeah. Moody Bible Institute back in the day, you couldn't wear a beard. Everybody made a big joke that the statue of Moody out in the lobby had him with a beard. <laughs> <laughs> but you couldn't wear a beard at Moody in those days. You can now. Mm-hmm. That's yeah, illegal. People, so people, that's the other side of things. That is the other side of things, yeah. But achieve your beard. Yeah, no, it makes Be me a look, godly man, right? Yeah, it makes me look a little older. <laughs> I need all the help I can get. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you being here and uh, really excited about it. If you haven't listened to the message, I encourage you to go online on our website, calvarystp.org, and listen to it. You'll uh, be blessed by it. Uh, it'll be down below. And uh, you guys have a great day. Calvary Recap, special edition. We are done. <laughs>